delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Singalani, uh, who's in uh, Los Angeles, and you can see he's uh, standing in front of uh, uh, Cedar Sinai Medical Center there. Uh, Dr. Singalani uh, earned his medical degree from the University of La Plata uh, in Argentina, and then he went on to a extremely extensive uh, clinical training uh, at both Johns Hopkins University, uh, actually the University of Baltimore as well, I believe, and Cedar sinai uh, Medical Center. Uh, he's a uh, clinical electrophysiologist who uh, has, has the temerity to work in the field of basic science and is a specialist in preclinical research. Um, he is the director of cardiogenetics uh, at and uh, at Cedar sinai Medical Institute and a uh, board certified clinical electrophysiologist. Uh, the title of his talk today is Targeting Arrhythmias with Extracellular Vesicles, and I'm delighted to uh, have the chance to uh, uh, hear this uh, marvelous presentation. Thank you, uh, Daryl, very much for the kind introduction. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to speak today about our ongoing work. Uh, I thought uh, today we'll focus, I have no relationship to this close, and uh, today I'd like to start with a, a small introduction and background about what's the present uh, of therapies for ventricular arrhythmias, uh, discuss a little bit the challenges that we have at the moment and the evolution of mapping and ablation technologies for arrhythmias, and then introduce the concept of cell-free therapies or extracellular vesicles for ventricular arrhythmias uh, using uh, those models that I have been working on, one of ischemic cardiomyopathy and the other one of a familial condition called arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, ARVC or ACM, as some people are recently calling this entity. So to start, let's say that heart failure patients they die suddenly, either from arrhythmias or pump failure. 50% of those deaths are heart failure and are considered to be sudden. And arrhythmias, either ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation, account for the majority of those case, cases of patients with heart failure that they die suddenly. To prevent that, or to treat that actually, we as clinical electrophysiologists implant defibrillator on these patients. In the US only, there are over 100,000 implants per year. 38% will fire a shock within five years and 20% of them, they will have recurrent shocks, what we call BT storm. The problem with that is that not only increases the hospitalizations and heart failure, can also increase mortality when someone has frequent shocks and it's important to remember that decreases the quality of life significantly. Nevertheless, it's the best way that we have so far to prevent these patients from dying. When patients have BT storm or frequent shocks, we have two ways of treating them. One is with antiarrhythmic medications. The other one is with radiofrequency ablation. This has been compared in multiple studies. And I'm just pointing out Two of them, one from 2006, the other from 2022, from two different groups, where they compare antiarrhythmic drugs to radiofrequency ablation. And as you can see, ablation seems to be beneficial. And I'm not going to go into the details of the design of the studies, but I'm going to say that in general, ablation seems to be beneficial uh, comparing to antiarrhythmic drugs. And this is driven primarily by BT shocks and BT storm of the composite endpoints and not necessarily by mortality alone. Why do we do ablation? Well, this is a gross specimen of a patient with infarction. And you can see that you have the scar. And if you can see inside the scar, you have small strands of biomyocardial tissue that will conduct the electrical impulse in an abnormal way, in a slowish way, as you can see here in this cartoon. I have to say this cartoon, is a two-dimensional representation of a much complex phenomenon, which is in three dimensions. But I think it's good for the purpose of this talk to understand that if you have scar, you have normal myocardium outside, and you have this strand of slow conduction, you have a setup for re-entry and ventricular arrhythmias to occur. 
With this concept in mind, radio frequency ab ab ablation was developed, and most of the study were effective in one year follow-up. Uh, when the cardiomyopathy progresses over time, there's usually more VT. And it's important to say that this is limited to specialized centers, and they're long procedures, and they can be complications, even though they are not very frequent in experienced centers. So if we look a little bit about the story of the treatment of VT, in the 50s, we began to realize that SCAR could induce VT and the aneurysms you know, could induce VT around those regions. Then many years passed until the 80s and the 90s where we started using high energy ablations and radio frequency ablations. And later on, we can where we are today where we have special technologies to map more carefully in high resolution and be able to update VT. So there are, however, challenges and needs for VT ablations. So which are those? Where we have problems with optimal timing and indication of the ablation, and there are studies that they keep on going about the timing, when to keep our patients in medicines, when to refer them for ablation. Also, Ablation for unstable patients can be a problem. When patients, we induce VT and we have no blood pressure, we cannot map those episodes and we rely to extensive forms of ablation, like destroying a lot of myocardium, what we call soft drug modification. Ablation in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with that scar can be in the middle of two regions. Sometimes it's difficult to reach and that can be problematic as well. For that, there are emerging and new technologies. There are new trials, as I mentioned, to compare two strategies. There are mechanical and circulation support, so patients can be put on ECMO, on an LVAD or Impella to be able to map those patients when they're not stable. And there are also improvement in the tools to define the substrate in a great extent. We started with mapping tools that they looked like this in the 90s. We took like 20 minutes to obtain 50 data points to ablate patients with BT. This is where we are today in the 2000s, where we can in 20 minutes obtain over 2000 data points using multiple electrocatheters. As you can see in this map, you have a greater resolution in less amount of time, which is important for patients that you need to keep them in BT for a long time. This is an example of a high resolution map on a patient with MIT and SCAR. You can see here that in 20 minutes, you can define this channel and ablate this region and stop the BT circuit. In this particular case was a patient with extremely low EF with a cardiomyopathy 15%. So the faster the mapping, the less time the patient is in BT and that's favorable for the outcomes. We also are using new technologies combining high resolution MRI in three dimensional. And you can see in the, in the right, you can scan those uh, areas of the ventricle from the epi to the endo and detect with the MRI small channels or scar or gray zones of slow conduction and integrating this with a 3D mapping system. We can have a better plan to where to go where we have the ablation procedure. We are using this technology both in patients and also in animals to try to define more disaster modifications that we are doing. Energy tools, tools and ablation techniques, they also continue to improve. Uh, radio frequency energy has been used for many years. Cryoablation or using coal to ablate has been used too, primarily for AFib, but also for other uh, conditions. Pulse feed ablation is an evolving technology that uh, claims to be more selective for uh, the um, myocardium and sparing the nerves. Uh, some people are infusing ethanol in deep branches to uh, ablate deep tissues. And external radiation has been utilized for radiation oncologists in combination with electrophysiologists to ablate areas that are hard to reach. So despite everything that I said, the treatment for VT and recurrent shocks can be difficult, especially in unstable patients. Ablation can be selective in destructing bundles of biomyocardium to interrupt that, but it's effective in one year follow-up. And as I said before, destroys viable myocardium, which is a little uh, paradox because we have patients with decreased EF and we're bringing them to the lab to destroy even more myocardium to stop the arrhythmia. So the hypothesis that we came up is rather than destroying that slowly conducting tissue, 
if we could use a fibrotic, antifibrotic, or regenerative strategy, either cell therapy or cell derived, that could, in principle, improve conduction and disable reentrant BT. So, to reemphasize that, in the substrate we have this low conduction zone. The classic approach will be to ablate and homogenize that scar, and that's going to be turned all blue or scar, then scar to destroy myocardium and disable reentry. The therapy that we are trying to develop, or we're studying now, is to use the opposite, a strategy that will regenerate myocardium and shrink that scar and make reentry less frequent. So let me introduce you a concept that many of you are familiar with and uh, been work uh, firsthand of cardiofuel derived cells. There, is, there are cells, stromal cardiac cells that have been developed first described at Rachel's Mill when they were in Hopkins in 2007, uh, that they are CD105 positive, CD45 negative. They are created for cardiac explant with a special culture technique, and they grow from cardiospheres, and they can be cultured in different conditions. They've been studied in different human trials and in the lab, but I think it's important that the methods of the activity can be reproduced by 75 labs worldwide. Uh, they have studies more recently, the Hope Duchenne, that phase two is finished and the three is recruiting. And they have paracrine effects that promote cardiomyogenesis. They prevent apoptosis, they're antifibrotic and anti inflammatory. So, cell therapies have some advantages. They've been tested in humans with excellent safety profile. As I said, in the case of CDCs, they've been studied in multiple human trials, including phase two and phase three. However, there are fragile living material. QA and QC release index criteria can be complex. They can have problems with the immune system and rejection and immune memory, reason why repeat dosing can be a problem. With this in mind, we ask ourselves, can we implement cell-free therapy where a single entity can mimic all the benefits without limitations? So then the concept of exosomes or extracellular vesicles came. These are 30 to 150 nanometer particles that are present in all body fluids. They are released by nearly all cell type. The payload, it's very cell-specific. They are loaded with not only mirrors, but either non-coding and bioactive contents. And the payload is very cell-specific, as I mentioned before. Back in the day, and this has been reported by Ibrahim and Marvam in 2014, they realized that most, if not all of the effects of CDCs were related with exosomes. You can see here the section fraction in animals with vehicle and CDC exosomes. And you can see here where the uh, uh, secretion of exosomes was blocked by a compound, CW4869. The effect was completely abrogated from CDCs. In other words, uh, supporting the notion that the benefits of CDCs are driven by the secretion of exosomes, these bioactive particles. So with that in mind, we said, can we inject exosomes into cells of long conduction and improve fibrosis, therefore improve MBT caused by reentry? And this is work that's been pioneered and led in the lab by James Dawkins, uh, who we implemented a porcine model of ischemic cardiomyopathy with the idea of suppress VT in this condition. So this is how the study looked like. We randomized pigs to receive either CDC or placebo. We performed 90 minutes occlusion on the Proxima LAD, followed by reperfusion. We wait for eight weeks for the, for the MI to mature. And then we perform program stimulation, a rhythm inducibility that we do in the clinic. We did high density mapping and we injected through NOGA that we'll describe in the next slides in the zones of low conduction. Two weeks after that, we repeat MRI, EP study, and the mapping, and we did histology and proteomics on those animals. And as I said before, animals were randomized to receive either exosomes or extracellular vesicles or media. The mapping was performed using high density, as I mentioned before. And for those of you not familiar with these uh, 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 technologies, we have a first component here that match with the QRS of the ventricular repolarization 
depolarization of the uh, uh, electrogram. And then you have a second component, what we call isolated day potential. Those are surrogates of slow conduction when we are mapping BT clinical. And you know those two distinct zones can form a loop and favor arrhythmia. So clinically, we usually target those areas when we are doing subtract modifications. The idea here is the reverse one, to go back and target those areas with exosomes. We use a catheter called Noga Myostar, which is one unidirectional EP catheter that can map voltage and activation. The particular uh, thing about this catheter has this retractable needle, and that allows you to inject in the myocardium cell or cell-derived products, and also is being used for gene therapy products as well. So th this is one of the examples where we're doing high-definition mapping with a multi catheter identifying those initial and late potentials. And then we go back with the lower resolution, but we already identify those areas by the higher definition. And we inject in those zones of low conduction with NOGA exosomes in those animals, either exosomes or placebo. The SCAR, this is like late gadolinium enhancement MRI. And you can see here the small white region here in the septum. It's decreased post compared to pre. The 3D, the 3D reconstruction is a little more telling. And you can see a little bit more in this particular example how this scar is reduced after follow up. When we quantify this, this using the AHA segmentation, we can see that pre and post in controls, things got worse. And in exosomes here in the bottom, they improve compared to controls. Pre and post, pre and post, this is the same animal per analysis. When we do the analysis, we can see here in controls, the original LCE goes up. And here on the right, the LCD in the treatment goes down. I have to say that these are not great changes comparing to previous studies in ischemic myopathy. There are small changes, but you need to keep in mind that here we're injecting in those isolated forms of slow conduction with the purpose of improving conduction and not improving the overall EF. When we measure cardiac function, also by MRI, we saw that controlled animals they have a mild decrease in the ejection fraction and exosome treated animals they have increased in the ejection fraction. Cardiac output was also increased, primarily at the expense of changes in the end systolic volume with a trend, but not significant difference in the end diastolic volumes. The conduction improvement was also measured by 3D mapping pre and post. You can see here that those late potentials that I mentioned before either disappear or they became closer to the initial deflection and the initial component. And this was measured by the number of late potentials in controls and exosome animals that decrease in exosomes and also the timing, the timing of those late potentials I mentioned before, they became closer to the initial component where they didn't disappear in exosome treating animals compared to controls. We perform a rhythm disability study like we do in the clinic. And this is to me, it's a very telling uh, slide when we see uh, the induction of VT in an animal treated with exosome at baseline. And after that, normal sinus rhythm. The quantification was the following. Most of animals were inducible at baseline and none of them was inducible after follow-up. When we compare these two controls, striking difference. All of them were induced at baseline and most of them except one was uh, uh, inducible you know, during follow-up. So, Great improvement with exosomes, and most of the controls, all of the controls were inducible during follow up. This is despite a very aggressive protocol going all the way up to S4 extra stimuli down to effective refractory period. We then did a longer follow up study, uh, uh, four weeks, two weeks longer. It's not, I know that comparing to clinical studies, this is not really long, but it's, uh, you can imagine that it's. Uh, difficult and expensive to perform large animal studies. So we were able to push it for two more weeks and with smaller amount of animals. And as you can see here, 
uh, controls were inducible except one and exosomes became mostly not inducible with similar directions in changes in uh, the uh, regional LGE or fibrosis and ejection fraction. So we were happy with these results, even though there were a small number of animals, as I said before. We then did proteomics uh, uh, in this uh, infrared zone. You can see here on the left are the placebo, green being down regulation and red being up, black no change. You can see big contrast with the right here that most, looks almost the opposite on the proteins that were up and down in the infrared zone. We selectively picked some of them with informatic analysis that were related to cell proliferation, inflammation, and fibrosis. And we uh, did bioinformatics analysis seeing that these uh, pathways, many of them convert to TGF, beta-1, and TNF, uh, uh, and that was partially due to the effect. I have to say that the peak proteomics libraries are limited. So uh, the uh, evaluation was not in depth that we, should, we would like have, but we did a deeper uh, study in the next study that I will show. Fibrosis was reduced by histology. And you can see uh, this, uh, you know, uh, in this uh, small analysis. And this is control and exosomes and fibrosis was decreased by histology, as you can see here in this slide. This is KI67, a measure of cell turnover. And you can see here that controls, you have few cells. And in CD exosomes, you can identify some KI67 positive cells emission of cell turnover. Then use an in silico study with one of my collaborators in, your, in Sean Hopkins, Natalia Trajanova. For those of not you're familiar with her studies, she developed an in silico reconstruction of the anatomy and architecture of the ventricle and does a in silico VT study and can simulate uh, BT with the uh, reconstruction of geometry. She did that and uh, published this initially, but then validated in humans. That's why I thought it was interesting to send her our studies and our images. As you can see here on top before treatment, the arrhythmia was not sustained and was a blocking point you know, here. And then the arrhythmia continued to sustain. After treatment, arrhythmia was blocked on the injection site that could not sustain using her in silico model. So the summary of this first part, I will say that Reducing the scar while CD exosome into some low conduction, improve cardiac systolic function, decrease isolated lay potential that are markers of low conduction, and less inducibility of ventricular arrhythmia by arrhythmia induction study was observed after treatment, both of two weeks and four weeks follow. -up. The experimental findings were reproduced in silico by reconstruction of the electrical activity based on the NMR image that we sent to. Natalia Trajanova at Sean Hopkins. The second portion of the study is a uh, Roland study that we performed to study exosomes or extracellular vesicles and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which is a familial condition characterized by progressive breakdown of heart muscle, myocardial tissue death, and fibro fatty replacement. It has characteristic ECG changes. There are T-wave inversions and incomplete right bundle and an epsilon wave, which is a little notch in the QRS that you can see in the right precordials. It has family history, MRI findings are characteristic and they have ventricular arrhythmias. Interestingly, patients are phenotypically normal at birth, but the clinical features such as syncope, ventricular arrhythmias and heart failure, they rarely evident until 21 to 35 years of age. It's a disease of the desmosomes, that keep the cells together. And there are multiple genes like desmin, desmoplakin, plagoglobin that can be mutated. And these proteins of the dexomes, when they're affected, the cells have multiple disruptions that they tend to be progressive, especially with exercise, and they have arrhythmias. The progression of the disease can be long, and this is a correlate of human in mice. You have a prehistologic phase that is asymptomatic. There's a preclinical phase. Then early on in that presymptomatic phase, patients can develop arrhythmias and sometimes they present with arrhythmias as the first event. And then you can have evolution of the disease with heart failure and severe heart failure and time goes by. 
This usually happens 10 to 20 years and 20 to 40 years in humans. In mice, two to three weeks and three to four weeks in different models that they have been studied. When arrhythmias occurs in ARBC, despite antiarrhythmics, uh, ablation has also been used. It's a little counterintuitive in a diffuse disease, but the reality that ablation in the outflow tract of the right ventricle doing structural modification and also PVCs have been described and they've been effective sometimes in temporizing these patients when they have multiple arrhythmias. As I said, inflammation is also involved in ARBC, which is the theme of today's talk. And there are multiple studies that they link the role of inflammation, especially NF kappa B, on promoting inflammation and apoptosis in these patients. And that's been studied for multiple investigators for many years. With the idea in mind, this study was you know, led by Yen Yen, a brilliant fellow that now went back to Taiwan. And we took a desmoglin two mutant mice that we study uh, for ARBC, ACM, and did systemic delivery of extracellular vesicles. The study looks like the following. We used the wild type and mutant mice, and we did retroorbital injections of exosomes, multiple injections over time, follow the animals for eight weeks. We perform echo and in vivo electrophysiology. We also explanted those hearts and perform optical mapping using a voltage sensitive dye to map the arrhythmias ex vivo. And we then did biochemistry and molecular assays at the end to try to hint on the mechanisms involved. This is how it looks, uh, the functional studies. This is a section fraction of the wild type mice. The mutants, they go down. And the exosome treated ones, you can see that comes up a little bit, okay? As you can see, this is baseline. Endpoint, down and up. This is down because this is baseline, excuse me for the mistake. And down and up in the treated ones. The fraction of shortening goes in the same direction. This is baseline on the left and the endpoint on the right with catching up. And this is TAPSI for the right ventricular function that goes in the same direction, improving after therapy with extracellular vesicles. These are arrhythmias, the, uh, uh, my special interest. And this is by uh, provocative studies. We did this in mice by putting a catheter inside. We perform most incremental pacing, extra stimulated pacing and burst pacing, and very aggressive protocol. And you can see here that the wild types, very difficult, nearly impossible to induce VT in a mice. However, the mutants treated with vehicle, they develop VT, as you can see here. And they treated with exosomes, they did develop some VTs, but they were shorter in duration, non sustained, and sometimes they did not develop VT. Here are the quantification of the percentage, wild type, very difficult to induce, vehicles, easier to induce, and the treated with exosomes, difficult to induce VTs in this particular case. Uh, arrhythmia provocative studies, they have their own limitations. Because of that reason, we implanted our animals with telemetry, and we also found a spontaneous VT non-sustained BTs, but they were most likely non-sustained, non but we did find BT uh, in these animals that they were improved with exosome therapy. But we perform optical mapping using the Langerhoff of perfused heart. You can see that they have a spontaneous ventricular beat originated from the sinus uh, beat, that they have early after the polarizations after that, and sometimes they develop a spontaneous VT that they could map supporting the re-entry mechanism. Also, we performed the EP study in the language of heart, and we did B pacing and extra stimuli, and we were able to induce VT by re-entry as well in those animals that they did not have spontaneous VTs. When we wanted to study repolarization, we performed that by optical mapping. This is an isochromal activation map. And this is actual potential duration by optical mapping at different uh, degrees of repolarization. You can see, to focus your attention here, conduction velocity was decreased in vehicle treated mice and partially improved in those treated with exosome. The repolarization measured by actual potential duration, as you can see here in APD 80, 
was uh, prolonged in the mutants and a small reduction in those treated with exosomes. Same trend in 50 and 20 here on the bottom. Fibrosis, in this histology, you can see that fibrosis was markedly increased in the vehicle mice, was in the left and the right ventricles and improved with exosome therapy. This model of ACM, these mutants, they develop biventricular you know, uh, fibrosis and disease. There are some forms of uh, ARBCs that are primarily from the right ventricle. Some of them that are in the left ventricle and some of them are mixed. These mice tend to develop biventricular disease. When we wanted to analyze changes in conduction velocity, we said, well, fibrosis is impaired. That's partially explained. But let's study also connexin 43, which is the main gap junction in the heart. You can see here that connexin 43 was a decrease in the vehicle treated animals. And this is co-localizations with encalated in the intercalated disc. But when we were treated with exosomes, there was partial restoration to that. And this is quantified here on the right. The contents of the exons that were analyzed in this part of the talk today, I will focus on all the mirrors. There are multiple mirrors that are present in the extracellular vesicles, namely 4488 and 146A, many of them affecting NF kappa B signal, which is master regulator of inflammation and fibrosis and apoptosis as well. Because of that, we did RNA sequences of multiple genes here, and you can see wild types, mark difference with those with the vehicle, and a partial, partial restoration of this heat map when we treat it with exosomes. When we focus on analysis of inflammation and fibrosis, we did some Western blots on the different treatment groups. And I'm gonna focus your attention to NF kappa B here, the serine form that goes up and down in the treated animals. Also interleukin and TNF that are affected in the same direction in treated animals comparing to controls. This was done by RNA sequencing here, by informatic analysis that I'm not showing today, pointed out some uh, uh, inflammation genes, and then we perform uh, those uh, uh, by Western blood uh, in the different treatment groups. Also, as I mentioned before in the contents, MIR-4488, uh, was abundant in the extracellular vesicles and also affects NF kappa B. So we did some in vivo experiments where we treated the animals in vivo with the antagonist for 4488 and with extracellular vesicles or scramble. So you can see here, this is a section fraction and TAPSI. This is the RBA area, and this is the fibrosis and the effects of exosomes were partially blunted by the antagonist 4488, telling us that 4488 at least has a partial effect on the effects of our exosomes. So to summarize this uh, talk and the effect of exosomes of ACM, I will say that in XCM, we've seen that there's a disbalance with NF kappa B interleukin one beta six and TNF alpha. That is gonna create cardiomyocyte loss, damage on the intercalated disc, uh, translocation of collective for the and fibrosis, and that's gonna affect conduction velocity and, and action potential duration. That in turn is gonna create ventricular arrhythmias, decrease the section fraction, and increases in VRV size. When we treat with multiple intravenous EVs, we can reverse that phenotype, primarily by affecting NF kappa B, and that creates an improvement in conduction velocity and actual potential duration. And that's primarily related to conduction velocity to connection 43 and fibrosis and the animals they do better over time. So with that and go to the back slide, I think we, this is a modification for that nice review. Uh, 2012 and 19, we saw new mapping technologies and resolution. We took a well, while, we've been working this for many years, but we've recently been able to report that we file pre-ND to the FDA to see, evaluate our data to see if there's a possibility to do this in humans. And we're working towards that with new delivery techniques and hopefully be able to try this biological disaster modification for BT. 
So with that, I want to thank you, everyone in the laboratory that did the work. I highlighted James and Yan Yan Lin, who were the leaders in the two papers that I presented. But many other people work on these studies, collaborators both from Hopkins and uh, Cedars. Uh, I also want to say that this is a project that the research findings bring equity, diversity, and inclusion because VT ablation is limited to specialized centers. In the US and other countries, minority populations have limited access to centers. And if successful, this ter therapy could, in principle, bring BT therapy to lower complexity centers and to underserved populations. The research team in my laboratory is quite diverse. Uh, that's given through Cedar Sinai Diversity Committee and Latinx Committee. Personally, uh, because of my background uh, being from Argentina, I frequently give talks to uh, Latin communities and lectures uh, through Latin American countries, and that helped me uh, diversify my research team. And diversity started uh, very many years ago uh, in our team. As you can uh, recognize uh, here, uh, Dr. Davis here on the right, I'm here on the left. This picture has almost uh, 20 years, but we did have a very diverse group and with great colleagues that we still meet sometimes all around the world. I would like to thank you very much for the invitation again, and happy to take any questions. Oh, is there? Can you hear us? Uh, yes. Okay, good. All right, great talk. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you for the uh, the picture on the end. You have to send it to me. I don't have a copy of it actually. I That'd will. Be great. <laughs> um, so we have a. Uh, we'll start with questions uh, from the group, and remember uh, to please uh, send them in uh, through the Q and A section of uh, Zoom. And the first question goes to. Uh, uh, Dr. Liang. Um, he thanks you for an amazing talk. And uh, oh, he's got many questions coming up here now. Um, it, one of his questions was uh, regarding the uh, pig study. He was asking, uh, were the IV, how many times were the uh, exosomes injected? So that's a great question. Pig study, uh, the uh, we uh, injected uh, in four to five spots in areas of a slow conduction a single time. So the treatment was not repeated dosing. In the moment that we mapped the animals, we identified those areas and we injected in those zones of low conduction. The number of injections are in four to five different stops, different spots. Uh, the total volume is about two cc's that we inject uh, for that. Uh, the I don't remember the amount of particles by proteins. It's like seven point five milligrams uh, uh, total. Yeah, I have a follow up on that one actually. Um, Noga has been discontinued. So what are you going to do? Right. So that's uh, that's uh, a good question. So there's two things that I'm doing. Uh, one is designing uh, my own catheter. Uh, that's number one, which is uh, a new thing for me. And so I, I don't know if I'm going to be successful in that. But the, uh, the interesting part that we are doing that is a follow-up study, we've been delivering this through coronary sinus injection by ballooning venous branches of the coronary sinus. Kind of the same thing that uh, Miguel Valderrabano is doing for VT therapy with ethanol, but like changing that technique and ballooning those venous branches, we develop the exosomes. And we do have very nice uh, results with the induced stability. Uh, we believe that the, uh, we are not as focal, but the inducibility studies uh, are useful. So yeah, so those approaches. Number one, uh, venous delivery through coronary sinus branches. Number two, try to see if we can, you know, come up with a new catheter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if anyone can do it, you guys can for sure. Um, I think, Peter, you had uh, questions there. 
Uh, yes, and uh, so uh, again, uh, congratulations, Eugenio. Fantastic presentation. You know, this is really uh, you know uh, tremendous impact. And uh, thanks also for the EDI you know discussion. You know, we really encourage that. And uh, I'm glad to, that you found the picture of Dr. Daryl Davis, who looks the same still. You know, so obviously we haven't stressed him out too too much. Thank <laughs> uh, you. I have thank a, you. yes. <laughs> thank you so much. That's a you know, really uh, great uh, for the history books. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, you know, it's so interesting that uh, you're now able to discuss with uh, FDA because, you know, obviously this is uh, going to be a very important step. And uh, I was just wondering, and you kind of mentioned uh, in your discussion that uh, the, uh, you know, the exosomes are much more reproducible in terms of, uh, you know, production and things like that. So I was just wondering, um, how do you, you know, make sure that uh, batch to batch, uh, you know, um, productions are as uh, similar to each other as possible, you know, because that's important in clinical trials. And then, then the kind of the other question, which is a really fascinating results you have on fibrosis inflammation, you know, which is really, I think one of the key mechanisms, you know, by which the exosomes are effective. And do you think that is due to some of the cargo contents in the exosome, you know, that's doing that, or in fact, the exosomal interaction, you know, just the, the fact that these are small particles that's able to actually, you know, engage kind of the, the tissue interface uh, will be able to do that. You know, sort of what do you think the anti-inflammatory effect that's so prominent uh, comes from? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Liu, those are excellent questions. Thank you very much for those. Uh, so I want to start with the SEA. Uh, the, uh, we, we sent all the big study uh, to the FDA and, uh, uh, propose some release criteria of batch to batch. One of the things that uh, we were asked to develop more clearly is a potency assay in vitro to be able to, as you mentioned, uh, have some specific release criteria. And we're doing that in vitro, okay? We have a couple of options, but we are still uh, fine tuning that to, to be able to have a good potency assay and to have release criteria prior to go into the clinical trial. So that's one of the to-do lists that we are working, uh, you know, at the moment. Uh, that's number one, but very important as you mentioned. Uh, the second one is regarding the effects. Uh, I think uh, many of the effects. I my studies have been focused on the cargo and the bioactive materials, and we identified many uh, key players. Some of them being microRNA, some of them being non-coding amylase or different types that they affect uh, inflammatory pathways. We have not focused on the second option that you mentioned, but it might well be that there's a component because we have yet to identify one single molecule that recapitulates everything. So, so it's, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent point and it's still something that we are studying actively, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, by Dr. Liang is in the mouse studies where the IV delivered exosomes enriched in the heart. Sorry, I think I, I think I missed part of the for part of the uh, question. Uh, in the uh, mouse studies where the IV delivered exosomes enriched in the heart. So the uh, the uh, the studies, uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, uh, no, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, if the question is about biodistribution, uh, there's a big amount of exosomes that they stay in the heart. There are some of them that they also go to the liver and the kidneys, uh, no much in the brain and the lungs. Yeah, to follow up on that, when you do an intramyocardial injection, what's your actual targets? Are they taken up by myocytes? Are they taken up by macrophages? Or what are the, what are the targets that uh, you guys are Think are most operational when you're fixing VT. Uh, yeah, we we uh, we uh, we haven't uh, addressed that in the peak correctly. Uh, we do know from other models that they are most likely taken up by fibroblast macrophages and mice up somehow as well. But we I cannot answer that experimentally because in the peak we haven't been able to narrow that down. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we really appreciate uh, 
the uh, insights into VT and uh, hopefully you can get that uh, into patients in the next few years. It's a tremendous advance. Well, it's, uh, it's exciting, but as you know, uh, you know, it's uh, everything is so new and there's a lot of uh, uh, hurdles to jump, uh, including the uh, funding that, that I'm working actively to be able to, to get uh, more funding to, to get into, uh, not, not the clinical trial yet, but in all the large toxicity and long-term studies that are gonna be needed prior to be able to get there, you know? So, but, but I think it's, it's exciting, especially for those uh, refractory patients that, that cannot be ablated or, or they're not stable and cannot be mapped, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. And thanks, uh, Daryl, for uh, wonderful hosting as well. Yeah, take good care. Thank you.